It's Thursday, it's four o'clock, and you're watching Chelsea and Tony Live, and we have an incredible show for you today because Lindsay Adler, the Lindsay Adler, is joining us and helping us review your portrait photos. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, guys. You're so sweet. Nice to see you again. I'm so excited to have you back. Last show was incredible. Yeah, people were so nice, and I got lots of nice comments over on my feeds, too, so I'm happy to be back. Good, good. We're going to give people a chance to submit their photos now. So if you haven't already done that, you can go to sdp.io slash submit and submit your pictures. And while you're doing that, I wanted to show off some of your work, Lindsay, because <laughs> I'm always stocking your portfolio for your new work. Look at this photo. Justin, can you show that? Oh my gosh, this is incredible. Yeah, and shot in a studio. I love that you sometimes provide the behind the scenes photos. Your Instagram is lit. It seriously is awesome. Everybody should follow you on Instagram. <laughs> I, every day I'm amazed by the stuff that you produce. Your control over light is phenomenal, really. So I'm, I'm a, like, I'm definitely a nerd when it comes to this, but it is like lighting is, it's physically delicious to me. Like when I take a, a photograph where the lighting is is glowing or it's rich, like it, it's, it, it actually feels fulfilling. I feel it, it's like eating chocolate. <laughs> I love that. I've heard you use that term before delicious. And then when I look at like beautiful golden hour light, I'm like, she's right. It is delicious. It's like, you want to like touch it. You want to gobble it up with your eyes. Look at these. I, I love, wow. I love, I love that we as photographers can find fulfillment in something as simple as light or texture. I don't know. I think it makes our lives so much more rewarding because there's so many things that can make us happy that other people might not get to appreciate. I love that too. Do you ever find yourself with your friends being like, guys, look, the light through the reeds. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. I have uh, hardly any life outside of photography. So all of my friends are somehow in the photo world. So they all like are like, oh, yes, I love that. This <laughs> photographers, makeup artists, models, hairstylists, like that's that's my world. They so get it. We're in that moment. They do get it. And look at these two shots. I wanted to show these off, too, because I like I never know what I'm going to get from you, Lindsay. It's just you can do anything and you're so creative and you're not afraid to try something new. And these and are both, both gorgeous. And both of those photos are taken with one light. Lindsay, I think I saw you, uh, you, did you do some behind the scenes or have a class? I saw you make the one on the left. Yeah, so I started on my YouTube channel. Um, I started doing something where I call photo deconstructions. So I will take photos that either people have responded well to or some creative technique that I've tried and I show people the entire process. So what I'll do is I'll show behind the scenes for the lighting, and then I'll show before retouching and after retouching. Because I think one of the things that confused me when I was getting into the higher ends of, of professional photography is, okay, wait, now what's done in camera and what's done in post? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out what's real and what's not. Because once you figure that out, it helps you, you know, for the style you're aspiring to, to fill in the blanks educationally of, okay, do I need to go to learn compositing? Oh no, I need to learn retouching. I need to learn color grading, something like that. So I kind of pull back the curtain and and let people see exactly you know what I was able to achieve for real and what's done in post. Yeah, you're an incredible teacher, um, and people should definitely check out your your YouTube channel. But what I really think people should check out, and I wanted to congratulate you on, is your master studio lighting course. I did have a chance to watch it, Lindsay. I got like three videos in and I was so inspired. I went right up to my video and I started shooting. You are an incredible teacher and this course is amazing. I'm so glad that you shared it with us. Um, you have like 50, over 50 videos. Yeah, this is actually, so I, I'm a photographer and an educator, but this is my most in-depth education I've ever created because I realized that what happened to me is that it took me forever to even be decent at lighting because I piecemealed it and I was always missing pieces of the equation. So I tried to create the course that I wish I had so that I could have become a master of light much sooner. Yeah. You, and you, the way you laid it out, I mean, I said before the show started, you seem so organized because you have assignments and quizzes. This is not like you watch and wonder what to do. You watch and then you are given a mission. And I think that that's so inspiring. And you have a Facebook group where you can help people and everything. It's incredible. And also, if you guys want to check it out at sdp.io slash light, um, Lindsay was generous enough to also include like a free series called Learning to See the Light. It's usually $60 and she's just going to throw that in for you guys. So 
You you could just spend fifteen years like intensively studying light and learning everything the hard way. No, Lindsay makes it easy. <laughs> okay, you need to watch the classes too because we need to tackle this together. Well, I, I mean, also I was lucky enough to be able to go to college for photography. So I was able to learn in the academic setting. And I realized not everybody can do that. Like not everybody can drop everything and go get a college degree in photography. A lot of us have lives or have other careers and we're trying to you know, take a turn to do photography. So I made this, it's more intensive than actually what I learned in college. Um, and I had a good college degree, but you know, sometimes there's uh, in academics, they dwell on things that can be done in an hour and they spend like weeks on it to fill out a four year career. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So uh, I tried to make it as impactful and succinct, but thorough as possible. I love that you also, you were doing this all of the time. This is your career. So you know exactly what to do and what you need to do to be a working professional. No, totally. I, it was, it was funny. So I, I'm a fashion photographer, it's fashion and beauty, but I actually shot an album cover for a pretty big rock band. Uh, recently. And I said, how did you find me? Why did like, why did you hire me? Which, by the way, I think is an important question you should always ask. If somebody's hiring you figure out what attracted them to your work. Uh, but I asked and, and the guy, it's funny, because he's got, you know, his face is painted white and has blood on it and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, so why did you hire me? And he's like, I love your lighting, you know, and so that it can cross across genres, um, even if most of my work is clean, pretty young models, you know, I've got this rock band that is attracted to the visuals. That is so cool. I love that he had a good sense for beautiful lighting. Yeah, it was super cool. Um, I think people are going to want this course right away when they see how great you are at critiquing photos. So let's dig right in and see what the viewers are submitting. Because we had over 400 pictures, Lindsay. <laughs> so far, and people are still sending pictures in. But here's yeah. the first one. Um, this, what do you think? This is titled, Lindsay taught me how to use two speed lights like this. So That's so cute. <laughs> Thanks. That's a really good title. Uh, so am I, I'm going to do critique overall. Yeah, sure. Give some tips, especially on like lighting and stuff, because I think yeah. a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, so if you can you bring it back up? Perfect. OK, so what's interesting is when you understand lighting, uh, you can break the rules and get them to work. So what I'm going to say about this photo is I can see in her eye there's a spot catch light, which is telling me that this is either a zoom reflector or it's a bare bulb, which is a hard light source. And what happens with hard light is that the skin texture really shows. Uh, and so one way to fix it, of course, is retouching, uh, but then also adding another fill light. And you can actually see uh, another catch light in her eye below. There's a reflector there, uh, which is what's filling in the shadows. And it helps bring up the lighting, because fill in the shadows, because this is meant to be a bit more feminine and soft. And if the shadows are too dark and heavy and you have the pink and it, like it, it contrasts. So I actually think it works really well. Um, I might raise the light up a little bit because you can see how low the light is in the catch light. If you raise the light up at a higher angle, it would actually define her cheekbones a little bit more, mm -hmm. uh, which I think would be a little bit more flattering and give a little bit more shape to the nose. Uh, but I think it's a successful photograph. Yeah, I agree. It's beautiful, but it would be nice if there was a little bit of a shadow just to give her face a bit of depth, right? Yeah. And I, I think one uh, unrelated to lighting, um, the hand is so close to good. It's it's really close. The problem is, is everything's really light and that shadow on the fingers inside the fingers is actually pulling my eye there. It's really, really close. Um, I think lowering the hand a little and wrapping it almost around the face a little would hide that. Uh, but it's not like it ruins the shot for me or anything. That is an incredibly good point. And I'm afraid of hands. Can I be real with you, Lindsay? I'm afraid of them. Don't blame you. They, well, <laughs> yeah, if you're not a professional model. They convey yeah. so much information and they can ruin a shot. They can and that's what we mean. Some people have ugly hands. <laughs> like some people just have like gnarly fingers and you put them in the shot and that's all you see. Um, but hands is definitely something that uh, I, I practice directing. And one tip is instead of having someone place the hand on the face, because that a lot of times looks forced, is I try to encourage movement. So I'll say like, trace the hand around the side of your face. Great, stop, relax your fingers, set it back down. And so you can actually see there how you see less of the inside of my hand, but it's still a very soft uh, shape of my hand. So sometimes motion helps get more believable hand placement. Wow, that's a really good tip. You're already giving away the good information, Lindsay. Good. <laughs> 
Let's move on to the next picture from Raphael. Definitely another use of hard light here, and actually a really similar pose, but a completely different expression. Yeah, I'm I'm impressed because that's not a pose that I would try, but I think it's kind of cool because I mean, if she's going to be in agony, look like you're punching yourself in the face, like that actually can work for me. Um, I. Man, I'm a fan of hard light. I think I commend the creator because so many people are afraid of it because it does show so much skin texture. But I think this is a good use of it because hard light emphasizes highlights as well. So you'll notice the highlights uh, in the eye makeup, those are emphasized and the highlights in the lips are emphasized when you use hard light. So I think if the concept is meant to be strong and aggressive, the light is strong and aggressive, the pose is strong and aggressive, uh, the expression strong and aggressive. Um, I can't help it. I keep looking at her tongue and her tooth. Um, oh. And I think it actually might be better to just darken those down, uh, like the actual darken the tongue way down, and then maybe smooth out the jagged tooth. Uh, and the reason right why now. is it's such an area of contrast. Your eye is drawn to contrast. And so I look there repeatedly. Um, and I, I feel like my eye got stuck there for a majority of the time I'm looking at the shot. Okay. Good suggestion. Can I ask you a technical question? Both yeah. of these have been shot almost at wide open. So they had this sort of shallow depth of field. Um, me personally, I probably would have shot a headshot with a controlled background like that at like F8 or F11. Where are you in in-studio shots, tight headshots? Perfect question. So if I'm not blurring out the background for a purpose. For example, um, it's a textured background that I want to be soft, or I'm going for something really romantic. I shoot everything at the same camera setting. So if you look at my shots, like nearly 100% of the time, it's the same. I shoot at 200, 211. So uh, I don't know if we have time for this, but can I explain real quick? Yeah. Okay, so I shoot at ISO 200. The reason being is that it's low enough of an ISO that it's clean, there's not going to be noise. But if I look at my photo and it's too bright, as I'm set up in the studio, I can drop it from 200 to 100, no problem. Or if I'm looking at it and it's too dark, I can go from 200 to 400 and I still have a clean file. So I don't have to change my other settings. Uh, one two hundredth of a second is to get rid of ambient light, unless I'm trying to get it to show, but usually I'm not. And then F11 is my safe aperture because if I'm not trying to blur out the background, if I'm shooting with a 30 megapixel camera, a 50 megapixel camera, I mean, any of the modern ones really, um, if I'm shooting at F4, and I miss my focus, it's gone. Like it is, it is mm -hmm. way gone. So unless the aperture is adding something creatively, mm -hmm. I'd rather shoot at F11 and give myself more flexibility so that if I accidentally focus on the cheek instead of the eye, it's still going to be a totally usable shot. Yeah, I think that was a mistake I made early on in a lot of just my portraits in general is thinking because my lens could be fast, I needed to have that wide open aperture. Totally. And it's so hard to get the eyes in focus and everything properly in focus if you're just like have a sliver to work with. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember when I first tried an 8518 and then I never left 18 for like 10 years. <laughs> and I had to like reel myself back in. <laughs> totally true. This picture actually, I think it makes good use of the shallow depth of field by kind of mm -hmm. eliminating some of that detail and giving it that ethereal feel. It supplements the mood, right? Totally. Uh, it, I mean, I think that makes sense. Is I say over and over again, and you'll probably hear me say this, is you know your intention is important and why you took the shot. So if it's meant to be soft, choose soft lighting. Well, the expression here is soft. The styling is soft. The makeup is soft. The lighting is soft. The aperture, narrow depth of field is soft. So I think that that's a great use of knowing what you were trying to achieve. Uh, I think it's beautiful. My critique would be the one finger that's mm -hmm. spread out a little bit. Yeah. It's a little distracting. And then... I don't mind the hair being messy because it's meant to be uh, an effortless photo. It's just right on the left-hand side of the photo where there's the little knot and then the little hole. It's I would go messier or cleaner. It's kind of a weird in between, uh, but it's not Where's like that? right here. Oh, with the hair, I see. That little knot. It's in that little hole, right? Because it's an area of contrast. So okay. I look at the hole and then that knot. Whereas I like the hair on her face, so maybe wispier would be better, like a little bit of movement, but good shot. I'd be happy if I shot that. Is that the kind of thing you would fix in post or are you reviewing the pictures so closely when you're shooting that you're fixing like individual clumps of hair? 
I would get rid of that hole in post, but I would, I try as much as possible to fix it in camera. And uh, there's different schools of thought on how much you should be shooting. But when I shoot, I actually take a ton of frames. Uh, I, I don't mind uh, overshooting if it's me, okay, let's blow the hair a little bit. And when I'm shooting, each little movement could be the difference between a good shot and a great shot. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mind shooting more to capture it. Yeah, I think that's a good philosophy. Um, and I really love this photo. I love their processing too. It matches the mood of the photo, just this soft, um, not really bright photo. Congrats, Finn. Yeah, love it. Pretty. Do these skin tones look a little green to you? Can you see? Well, I can't be sure since I'm, you know, like, I mean, my monitor is calibrated, but I'm not sure if the feed is. Maybe a little bit stylistically. I don't hate it. Like maybe I don't, like that is more real to the skin tone. Um, okay, so my first reaction was, ooh, pretty. Like it was successful in its immediate impact. So I was drawn to her eye, I'm drawn to the moodiness of it, to her hair, but then I got stuck on the hand. Um, <laughs> yep. And the hand Hands is so, so light hard. and it's flat against her, her, her chest. Dark. Yeah. I, think if it's meant to be anguish she could be gripping and it would communicate something but right now it's light against dark so I just I got drawn there for a while in the shot yeah I'll agree with you now this is why I said I'm afraid of hands because they convey a lot of information we're naturally wired to look at hands and mm -hmm. kind of draw emotions from them and feelings from them and it's difficult to pose them yeah I mean I think I'm trying to figure out if I can it might be like a little turn or maybe tucked behind the neck because it's with a head roll or something yeah. like a little more like this. I don't know. I mean, I'm trying. <laughs> I actually think your motion tip would have worked great if they had yeah, just had her like kind of like move her this. hand like this and snapped a bunch of frames. Yeah. Maybe they would have found like that perfect pose. But I do. I do love that photo. I think it's a beautiful photo. Mm -hmm. For sure. I chose this picture because I, I saw some issues with the light that I thought you'd have some more insight into. Totally. So what is happening in this photo that I would improve for the lighting is that the light is too low. Uh, and I can tell it for a couple of reasons. So the first way is because the catch lights are low and having low catch lights doesn't make a photo bad, but what ends up happening is the direction of the shadows. So you can see the shadow from her nose is kind of pointed to the side. Um, also, the shadows kind of next to her lower part of her face, they kind of go up into the side. And it does not make her face have ideal shape and proportions. If you have it a little higher, what it'll do is it'll improve the cheekbones and it won't show this. You see how there's that little bit of uh, mm -hmm. like shape next to her face here. Uh, so it's just going to be a better shape overall. Uh, to have it higher aim for my goal is aim for eye level or a bit higher um usually i am about maybe you know it's like six six inches to a foot above eye level but that depends on your modifier and the distance of light so like there's a lot of things that go into it but i can see they're using a beauty dish there how often do you use a ring light Lindsay? i seldom do yeah. It's actually a common modifier in, in fashion photography. Um, one of the reasons I don't is because ring light is kind of just lights everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's not as much control. So I can't sculpt the light the way I'd want. That being said, my significant other, he uses a ring light all the time to fill in the shadows. So it'll just, it's actually his fill light just to bring up a little bit of detail. Okay. That's a good idea. That's a creative way to use it. Mm-hmm. Good chance, Scott. I would also say with Sorry. with this shot, we're getting a little bit of that floating head and arm effect because her clothes are disappearing. So the composition could be worked to be a little bit more flattering for her. It's kind of a peaceful mood here, again, with the shallow depth of field. Um, what do you think, Lindsay? Yeah, I think it, it's successful in the initial mood. Like it's supposed to be pensive. It's supposed to be soft. I would think that this is, it feels kind of bridally to me. Um, like, a, you know, taking the, the, a bride aside in a moment and catching something thoughtful about the day. Um, 
if for a portrait, you know, if the girl likes her pink lips, go for it. But in this shot, it's kind of all I look at because mm -hmm. everything else is really subdued and really gentle. And then those that neon pink is grabbing my attention. So I get it. If it's the bride and that's the color she wore, so be it. Uh, but I would tone it down a little bit. Yeah, I toned it down just a tad in post, but I agree it wasn't matching the mood of the photo. How important is your makeup team to you, Lindsay? Oh man. So I, I mean, if, as a fashion and beauty photographer, it's, it's, it's everything because they understand what I want and they help me execute my vision. But when I say fashion and beauty, then people dismiss the importance of it for portraiture. Mm. Um, you can't hire me without having a hairstylist makeup artist because there's so much that you can start to channel a certain mood or a character. And, you know, when someone looks and feels great in the mirror, then when I'm taking their photo, they're feeling so much more confident and it makes my job as a photographer easier. So you, you literally, you can't hire me to do your photo unless we have hair and makeup. Um, and I also think it, it just helps build your self-esteem because the whole time we're doing hair and makeup, you know, we're, my team is, is complimenting you and getting to know you and connecting with you. And then when you finally sit in front of the camera, which is scary, well, you're already warmed up to us. Oh, that's a really good point. It's it's time to get to know each other and to make the model feel better in front of the camera. I'll say I knew you had an amazing makeup person because you so frequently use very hard light in your photos. And if your makeup is not on point, then hard light will look absolutely awful. If you shoot with hard light, have a perfect makeup person. Yeah. Or overexposure highlights so you can't see anything and then it's a cheat, but it looks like an old vintage photo. <laughs> okay. Another good tip. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll take a note of that hot tip. Let's go to Sam real quick. Sam right, is here moderating and she's taking your questions. As you Hello. Hello. Already know. Hi, Sam. Hi. Um, so many questions and okay. comments. Um, we'll start with one of the paid ones first. Frankie Adams would like to know, Lindsay, do you edit in Capture One or Lightroom and why? Oh, okay. So this is a hot topic <laughs> in my life because uh, for ages I was editing and tethering into Lightroom. And one of the reasons why is because it's one system and I was comfortable with Lightroom and I, I loved the workflow process of it. The problem is, is it, it just doesn't work well for tethering. Um, so for those of you who don't know, tethering is I'm connecting my camera to the computer. And as I'm shooting, it's popping up so I can review the images. And for my career, I have to be able to do that because I have clients that are looking and they're checking uh, the color and the composition and how their product works and all of that stuff. And Lightroom was it has the ability to, but it, it's just really unstable and it breaks all the time. Uh, so I switched over to Capture One and I am... I, I'll put myself at the 70% mark for understanding and working my way through it. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a little bit less natural for me, but um, tethering works without a, without a glitch. It's great. We actually use both. I tether with Capture One and then use Lightroom. I know. I want it all in one place, but it just, it's hard. Yeah. I talked to the Lightroom team and I begged them to please fix tether and they, they just did. recently made some made some improvements, so I got to yeah. retest it myself. Maybe it's better now. All right, I tested it last week and it broke. Okay, I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> totally trust you. Okay. I'm hoping that they they. Thank you for it. for uh, telling us that, so we don't have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sam, okay. what else do you have, Sam? Um, we've got a quick little comment here from Life's Beautiful, <laughs> Lindsay. You're so amazing and a fantastic teacher. Um, We've got a question from Gary Fancher. Oh, nope, sorry. This is a, another comment. Uh, loving your posing book. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have and that then, book too. Uh, Chris A says, technically and professionals, professionally speaking, could you produce work as good as yours is now, but with cheap APS-C sensors uh, and no extra money for hair and makeup, no extra fancy lighting, just like basic crop sensor bodies, can you produce what you're producing? Okay, so that's a super interesting question um, because now that I so understand what I really need from light and from my gear, I absolutely could create the quality image, but the hair and makeup part is actually the part that's a little different uh, because what I put in front of my camera is so important to what the final result is. So yeah, if somebody walks in and they rolled out of bed and they're in sweatpants, it, you will, there's no way to get it to look like that. But as far as my lighting 
And as far as the camera, I could make it work. It's just about, is it easier with the gear I have? Yes, but I understand it enough that any gear could work. Um, I kind of explain it in the example of a car. Um, you know, anybody, a junker car can get you from point A to point B. It does the job. You get the nicer car because you want it to be more reliable or faster, or maybe it has some comfort uh, capabilities, or you just want to feel fancy. It's one of those. But can you get to where you need to go with the cheapest, ugliest car? Yeah. So I think the same way about my tools. Your Master Studio Lighting course has a whole section on gear. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Tony. Yeah, you can pick it up at sdp.io slash light. <laughs> totally. I mean, and, and I actually talk about that. Um, and, and there's a section about mixing speed lights in expensive studio strobes, expensive studio strobes. Um, you can mix and match and you'll see that it, it can work. You just have to know the exceptions. Like if I need to, you know, shoot off a ton of frames uh, in a row, then maybe I would need a more expensive strobe with faster recycle times, things like that. So it's understanding your gear and their limitations. Let's take a look at this picture from John Hendricks. And I, you can probably imagine why I thought you would like to review this because it is quite similar to your own style in that John has very carefully controlled the light and hidden enough from us to make it interesting. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is this is totally in the style of things that I love. Because I think when something's timeless, then you don't have to worry about it going out of fashion in a few years. It can last longer in your portfolio. Um, my critiques would be that shadow, I wish it were a teeny bit higher off of her lip. Like just give, give her the full lip. Give mm. me like like a couple centimeters, millimeters more. Um, just like a little bit there. Uh, and then the hands, the, the hands looked a little bit awkward um, and they looked a little bit bright. So I'd either yeah. tone them down, repose them or crop it out like you're seeing here. It's just because it's flat to camera and they're so bright. And then you only see the two fingers of the back hand. Looks, so yeah. I think the hands need a little reworking. I'm, I'm just cropping out the hands because that's the only thing I could see. Yeah. Yeah, good suggestions. Um, let's see which you of know these. What? Oh, I wanted to do this one flower picture. Styling thing as well. Okay. I would also just lose the rope on the hat because it looks very formal, and then this looks like a beach hat. That's just a minor little, a little gripe. No, good call. Totally. How about this flower picture? This one really struck me. That's fun. It's creative and it's doing something a little different. Um, so, and I have an odd, weird thing that I noticed immediately. And this is such a weird thing to draw attention to, but her catch lights are different sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that's like such a, a weird thing, but it gives the illusion to me that the eye closest to camera is droopy. Um, and so what I would actually do in post is I would copy the catch light out of the right eye and move it over to the catch light of the left. You could do this. There is a way to do it in Lightroom, or you could do it using um, a light and blend mode with a clone stamp in Photoshop. Uh, the ever, basically, in any of my photos, if the catch lights are uneven, I even them out because we love symmetry. And we love the idea that the sides of the face and the lips and all of that is uneven. And when something clues us in that it's not, uh, we think it's less perfect. I, I think that that's a very good point. And I've noticed this happens a lot with false lashes in photos because Absolutely. they they they're so heavy that they can block the light. And then you end up with eyes that the eyes can actually look asymmetrical or different sizes and it's unattractive. And you're right. It's because the light's not hitting them the same way. See, and guys, well, not maybe not all guys, but most guys don't realize how exhausting just fake eyelashes are to wear at the end of the day. Like you're, I, I, have you ever had your eyelids feel tired? <laughs> totally. I have not worn them because I'm such a weirdo, like anything touching me by the end of the day, I have to pull it off. <laughs> so I don't think I'd last. I, I used to torment my friends. I'd peel them off and stick them on them. <laughs> yeah. Look like little bugs. <laughs> I like that. It's a good strategy. <laughs> um, so these pictures were submitted during the actual live show. People actually view it. Oh, okay. This we're is getting from to the Chris Gregata. Thanks. Chris. I like the colors. Yeah, it's definitely got that cool pop and impact. Beautiful catch lights in, in the eyes. It's, so it's telling me that the sun is hitting probably a sidewalk or something by your feet and that's bouncing in and that's what gives you such soft light. So uh, that big 
sidewalk or whatever it is, is a really diffused, a really bounced light source that gives you a really nice texture to the skin. It's funny because I, I'll have to take your opinions on this because usually your eye goes to the brightest place. So the brightest place is the yellow on either side. Um, so my eye gets pulled that direction, but it's kind of fun because if she were in the sun, the entire mood of it changes. So it's, it's got a nice diagonal uh, shadow to it. So I, I think it, I think it's working for me. Yeah. I thought about possibly just lightening up the face mm -hmm. a tiny, just a lot. tiny bit, just to bring um, just a little more attention to it. And of course this is a sloppy edit because. I'll say I used to just shoot portraits and shadows all the time, but nowadays I, I just can't stand to shoot without some amount of artificial light, whether it's a reflector or something. You're right, Lindsay, that she's getting all the light bounced from the ground and we can see that from her catch lights. But as a result, she doesn't have any definition under her cheekbones. That's totally true. And the catch lights are a little bit weird. But I, nonetheless, I think Chris had a good eye for the location, like the kind of diagonal shadow across the bright yellow background. Like it's a great spot. Yeah. Pretty woman too. Beautiful. Yeah. She matches the whole mood of the photo. Totally. Okay. <laughs> I thought from the thumbnail, this was a swimming pool photo and it is not. <laughs> wow. Definitely impact right away because it's weird, but in a fun way. Because I get, I get storytelling, like, um, uh, okay, so is it, is this like an, a story about the environment? Like our, uh, our you know, season water's all drying up or <laughs> is it this, you know, fish out of water type story? Um, cool and weird. Yeah. I wish there were a little more room by his hands and I can see we miss focus a little bit, which is something we were just talking about. Yeah, his shoulders are in focus. Oh, yeah. But great shoulders. <laughs> Drawing attention to that. Yeah. And. I mean, I, I, again, I can't tell for sure from my um, from my screen, but you you know, adding strobe or adding a light source evens it out a little bit. But the whites are still real white on the sand. Yeah, yeah, Whatever it becomes just is. a huge reflector, right? Yeah. How many lights do you typically work with, Lindsay? Um, the answer is typically is not a thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'll say that for most people, I suggest that you start with one and master one. Because when you understand how to shape the light and quality of light and direction of light and all of that stuff, um, you know, some of my favorite photographs from my favorite photographers are one light. But adding a second light gives you more control because then you can add a rim light or fill light or a background light. But once you get to three lights, you can do a lot. It starts getting exponential of what you can do to combine them. So it, one to three is common when I'm lighting a scene, like a big space. I mean, it could be eight, but that's because it's a you know, whole space. A whole, you know, a whole room or something. Okay. What do you think? I have a question for you on this one that I see often. Black yeah. and white portraits. It bumps me when the skin looks just very ashen, just very all medium gray, all mid gray. What do sure. you, what do you do to, to prevent that? So a couple of things. Uh, one of the things I think I wish I could impart to people um, is how much, how, drastically different one photo can be interpreted that single file there I could make it look 10 different ways none of them are really right or wrong but they each communicate something so try this can you pull down the exposure darken it a little bit for me let me see and then pull it down even more like like try like a stop and then try popping the whites so bump, bump up the whites a little and then pop the clarity a bit So I can't tell from my screen, but that's usually my formula is something like that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm showing the before and after, and you can see the before, her whole face looks flat. There's no real highlights on her skin. So it ends up to me looking kind of sickly when you don't have some highlights. It ends up looking glowy with highlights. And now on the right, you know, the shadows are deeper. There's some highlights on her face. Her face has beautiful dimension to it. So that helped a lot. And, and people, I get this question all the time. They'll say like, oh, should I get rid of the highlights on the forehead or the cheek? Or I mean, there's there's a balance. If somebody looks greasy and it's 
extremely overexposed and sure you can tone them down, but highlights are good. Highlights are what make our skin maybe look youthful or it's uh, what gives dimension because highlights are, you know, what is protruding towards camera. So don't feel like, having highlights on, on the face is bad. It's just a matter of at what point are they distracting? Yeah. And I think sometimes I know I did in the beginning, you can go overboard with the skin because you think you want it to look perfect. But then at some point you reach that uncanny Valley where the person just looks like a creepy mannequin. Totally. You have to be yeah. careful. The creepy mannequin. Have you ever yeah, done it? I, I'm horrified by some of my early retouches. Yeah, me too. All <laughs> me too. Bye. Not by yours, by mine. I've I've really ruined some people's faces, and I um, apologize. And We're I'll say, obvious. as a guy, I don't have any training in makeup. But if I took this photo, I think the first thing I'd do is I would have the makeup artist apply a little bit more powder. Like mm -hmm. she's got that little too much of a gleam to her. Yeah, and for those of you who don't have a makeup artist, a really two really good suggestions. Um, there's something called HD powder. You can get it from yeah. CVS or Walmart or wherever. Um, and it's it works on any skin tone because it doesn't have color, but it you put it on the skin where it's shiny and it prevents some reflection. Or you can use something called blotting papers uh, and they absorb oil. So if somebody comes in, they're just really sweaty and you don't have a makeup artist, I always, instead of saying like, hey, you look really sweaty, I'll say, oh man, you know what? My lights are making you look a little bit shiny. Let's just dab that a bit. So then it's it's on me instead of them. Oh, that's so tactful. <laughs> I throw them a towel and be like, clean it up, grease ball. Come on. No, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. I use blotting papers. I'm always pretty shiny. So I'm familiar with them and they do work great. Okay. Wow. Here's a little girl by Mark Early. Dang, I love her attitude. That's for sure. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, you can tell right away inspiration is old masters, paintings and portraiture. <laughs> um, and what I think is really nice is that when you understand what the characteristics are of an old painting and you understand lighting, you can translate the two together. Um, so my my significant other, Chris Knight, like that's his specialty. Uh, and so we can look at a painting and go, actually, those shadows are uh, one stop under the main light. And so it's really interesting when you really understand your craft to be able to do that. Um, I mean, I feel like any mother would love such a regal looking portrait of their child. I, I do think he missed focus or something. It looks like it did. focus a little bit. Yeah, I think it's on the hair. Possibly. But this is one where narrow depth of field it might be beneficial to make it look painterly. It just means you have to be that much more careful. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's often I'm in continuous focus and I'm just shooting a lot and hoping that repetition will land me a couple of in focus shots for any given set totally this one's in focus that's for sure and we're at f11 so it yep there's that f11 for sure um can you bring it up one more time let me see if i can see yeah so i've got a square go. soft box off camera right here let me zoom in on the eyes so you can see well i mean you can tell for sure the light source um i mean and, and a soft light source just by default is what gives you more of a painterly look. Uh, I think it's nice to shape her face. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell what her face looked like uh, without this, but it's probably a little bit rounder and having the light off to the right-hand side of the frame is sculpting it in a nice way that I think is flattering for her. Um, I The expression is intriguing. I'm not sure what you want it to say. Um, it's very intense. So, I mean, I would just intention. What are you trying to get it to communicate? I do think there's a whole lot of hands and arms. Um, it's not that you can't use them, but if you actually map out the percentage of the frame they're taking up, it's quite a bit. So I feel like I get to her face, but then I get stuck on the hand and arm. So maybe a single hand or placing the hair over the hand, especially the one on the right. Because I mean, I'm, I'm getting stuck on the a lot. Yeah, I agree with you. It's a lot of hand. Yeah, um, it seems, I think he also possibly brought up I'm sorry. the highlights of the hand. The hand looks pretty bright and glowy. It's, it's, it can, there's something with the retouching that's making it glowy. Um, you know, what I can't tell in this photo, but another problem you often run into the hands is sometimes they are lighter. Uh, and I often will darken them down a bit and sometimes they don't match with color. And that's a Photoshop thing, uh, but I will, or you can do it in, in Lightroom as well. But you got to be careful with color and, and exposure because they got to match. Otherwise, it, your eye goes, like, what's going on here? Yeah. 
Let's see which of the thumbnails really catch our eye. Right, what do you see gonna, that you like? Let me ask. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, wow. This is Sarah Bowman. Oh, no kidding. That definitely caught my eye. Yes. Super bizarre and avant-garde and in a, in a fun way. Um, yeah, I, th I think it shows the photographer's skill set because there's a lot of difficult things going on there. Uh, because yeah. of course you're ban uh, balancing with ambient light, meaning the making sure that the candles are showing, uh, the makeup, getting that m metallic look so that the person almost doesn't look real. Um, if anything, I think the shoulders are kind of broad to camera it, it, because you know, your eye also looks at the largest place. So I, I definitely, I look at her eyes, I look at the candles, but then there's a lot of attention to the chest and I don't think the chest is communicating anything. So I would try to rotate it to the side to narrow out a little bit and bring the attention back to where it should be. Okay. Yeah, I, I, it's really beautiful. And I actually remember seeing the behind the scenes. I think she molded this whole headpiece on a mannequin. Crazy. I know. I mean, that's a good idea rather than on the person's head. <laughs> Yeah, they would have been there a while. The model would have actually been crying at that point. Yeah, okay. super cool. It is. Cool. I mean, I, and, and I think that makes a good point, though. As we look at this, it's concept that sticks out. Technique is important, but it's it's in service of what the concept is, and that's such mm -hmm. an unusual concept. Yeah, I love that it's different too. I I often see just the same pictures over and over again. For sure. You want to see if Sam has any questions? Yeah, Sam, questions, comments. Oh gosh, do I so many. I'm trying to pick some good ones here. Um, Kyle Wolf has a good one, our friend Kyle. Oh. Uh, for people occupied with a career outside of photography, what do you recommend doing to keep creative and practiced when you can't be completely immersed in photography? Totally. I mean, I think that you are not alone in this. I think so many people struggle with this. I've got, I've got such a long list. I mean, I think one of them is to make sure you have photo friends. Um, and that means we have such a strong community. And so who is that person that you can text photos to or have a conversation with that's keeping you involved and engaged in that community. But I also think managing your schedule and making sure that you're shooting, because what happens is if it's not your number one priority, a week goes by, a month goes by, many months go by and you haven't shot. And the more you shoot, the more creative you are, the better your skill set improves. So I think that anyone who's not immersed in photography, you need to set two days a month aside on your calendar so that you know it's coming, you prepare for it, it and it's a time to reward yourself. Yeah, that's a really good tip. And I think sometimes people get caught up on planning something epic and it can be more important to just go out and shoot. If, if you can't find the time to do something big. Yeah, flex your muscles, you know, you gotta build them up. Yeah, exactly. What else, Sam? Next question is from uh, Jim Setzer. This is a good question. Um, how do you break the ice with a new client or model to get them to loosen up and start to act naturally? Totally. So a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I actually make my clients fill out questionnaires before the portrait session. Um, telling me a little bit about them. And that allows me to maybe do a little research on a subject matter so that I feel like we have something in common to chat about. But everyone has a passion. Everyone has something that they feel excited about and that fuels them. So if I can figure out what that is, I get them talking. And I, lis I listen and interact in a genuine way. And I want to know more about this. So I think breaking the ice, the easiest thing is, you know, what do you love? Tell me about it and, and really ask questions. That's an excellent tip. Well, wow, that's an incredibly professional thing to do to get to know your client before they ever even walk in the door. So you know what they might want to talk about. Well, and for me, it's also because uh, we do, I do conceptual portraiture. So I want to know more about them so I can craft an image that suits their, their goals and their life and their story. Yeah. Very smart. Sam, anything else? Yeah, how about a question from me? Okay. <laughs> um, my question for you, Lindsay, is I've been watching you do this for since as long as I've been doing photography, and I know you've been doing it even way longer than that. And so my question for you is um, you always have such a great attitude, and you're always so friendly and free with your advice and, and very all of the tutorials. There's always so much information there. How do you not get burned out? And what do you do to kind of keep yourself feeling motivated and fresh and not kind of losing interest in what you're doing? Because it happens, you know, when you're doing something for a long period of time. 
Sure. I mean, my my answer genuinely is that it's shooting and teaching. Um, I think the two of them fuel me because when I teach and I give away all my secrets, then I feel like I need to go shoot and discover more secrets to share. And then when I go shoot and I discover something new, I want to go share it. And so I think the two two fuel each other because one makes me excited to do the other. Um, and then I just I surround myself with other people that are passionate about this. And so if for one one reason or another, I haven't shot anything recently or anything I'm excited about and I see someone else doing it, either they inspire me or it makes me a little jealous. And I want to get out there and challenge myself to be as good and be doing as much as them. So, yeah, it's it's community and teaching and all of that. Yeah. Yay. I'm glad I got to ask one. I never, I never ask questions. But <laughs> today. Let's, let's take a look at a few more pictures before we wrap up. Okay. Here's one from uh, Rick Snowden. And right away I'm struck by the processing. Like it's very powerful, but what do you think, Lindsay? I mean, it, it reminds me of um, old, the, some of the older pictures of Madonna. Mm -hmm. that heavy grain. I mean, it, the initial impact is gorgeous. Um, on uh, the arm next to the chest ends up being super distracting for me. Yeah. Uh, and I can't tell, you know, on my end exactly if the processing is maybe a teeny bit too heavy, maybe I'd back off of it like a third. Yeah. Uh, but man, that face, the, to like the toning, the depth of the, the texture and the blacks, it's like it instantly grabs your attention. It's beautiful. It is really beautiful. Let's see what else. What grabs your attention, Charles? Well, let's do a little scroll down. This one's very different. Oh, what a beautiful looking person. I know. Like, wow. Uh, great color theory. Um, definitely using opposites on the, the color wheel to create tension. And that person is striking. Um, I I don't, I would like to see a little bit more depth, like come, maybe coming around on the left a little bit more so that the, it's not so flat up against a wall. Um, the hand grabbing the elbow or like right on the elbow. I feel like I see a lot of hand maybe tucked under, but um, the color theory and the beautiful face is, I mean, that helps you get right up to really good. Uh, just those two things alone. I think it was the colors and the expression that really were grabbing me. Yeah. That person shoot that person more. Yeah. Like I want to shoot them right now. I know. I love interesting faces. Yeah, so interesting. Uh, let's see. What else? Are you seeing any that are grabbing your attention, Lindsay? I mean, there's there's a lot because there, there's a lot of cool things going on. Um, the, oh gosh, hold on, so you're going to read the numbers. Can you scroll back down one more time? So the, the black subject uh, on the white background was interesting. This one here? That one. Um, so this is an example to me where, if I wanted to bring this up, is where rules can be broken in my opinion, because this is where if you're, let's say, getting a photo critique at a print competition, I guarantee you it wouldn't do well. Not because it's not a great photo, but they would say, okay, there's no detail in your blacks and the light isn't necessarily flattering, but, I would see this type of shot done in an editorial for a magazine and it would be edgy. And because your subject's edgy and the expression's edgy, uh, then it would be successful. So I think it's also important to understand your audience. There's a lot of photos that I take that I might get paid well for, or they get good uh, response on social media. But if I enter it in a print competition, it might not do well. So I, I think you have to remember your audience as well. Yeah, I think it's super that's a cool. very good point, but I love how edgy this is. And I could see that in a modern magazine or uh, like a modern blog or something. It's it's interesting. And I like that it's kind of gender bending as well, because just from like the chest, like the neck up, I wouldn't know male or female, especially with the, the aggressive uh, expression. But then you can see the chest a little bit. And so it, it's revealing. But I, I think that's super. Uh, it it makes you have a question, which holds a viewer's attention in the you know in the days where we get a half a second, if yeah. that, to grab someone's attention. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome shot, Kabir. Okay, let's look at one more picture. Just tell us if anything. Oh, this is such pressure. I don't know. I'm okay. I can't handle this. There's this one of this. Uh, <laughs> that sounds beautiful. This yeah, that one caught gentleman. my eye. 
Yeah, super. He's ready for war. <laughs> Don't mess with this guy. Yeah. So first of all, what a f like what an intriguing subject, and I love his character. I, I feel like to some extent this is actually not him dressed up. I feel like this is what he's like. I really do. I feel like like this is the dude hanging out on the weekend. Um, it's got the old masters feel to the lighting, uh, the way that it's sculpting. You've got that beautiful highlight behind his head. I really like that because otherwise the picture becomes really flat. I do think I would have added one more light just for a teeny itty bitty bit of detail in the shadows instead of it falling completely black. Maybe on your guys' side, you can see it a little bit more. No, it's black. Um, yeah. I would, I would just add that because it, it adds a little bit more control um, and a little bit more detail. It doesn't mean to be light. It just could add that next level of finesse to your photograph. But I like the direction of like, I think maybe the highlights are a tiny bit hot. But again, I can't tell from my end. I think it's a little hot. Yeah, you're right. They're a little high. I'd have lowered the contrast in general just a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I do love the story of the picture. And I agree with you. This seems like him. And there's something so real about it, even though it's posed in a very traditional way. I like it a lot. I just noticed his belt is full of bullets. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. noticed that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just was like, wait a minute. He has like a, a fancy decanter over here. He's very cool. He's very cool. <laughs> yeah, but I think that little bit of light, would you'd be able to see into those details a little bit more. And if you didn't, you know, maybe it's uh, drawn attention to the table, you could flag it off and keep it dark, but on him for sure. Good tips. Lindsay, once again, you had incredible feedback for everyone. I love having you as a guest. I know that all of you learned so much today and trust me, there's much more to learn. I'm doing Lindsay's Master Studio Lighting course, and you should do it with me, and you get a free course today if you try it out, and that's at sdp.io slash light. Over 50 videos, 15 hours of tutorials. I know that you're going to love it, and I know that you now understand how great of a teacher Lindsay is, so definitely check that out. And Lindsay, I really hope you'll come back. Yeah, when are you going to have me back? Let's chat as soon as this is done. I'd love to come back. <laughs> I'm glad you love it. I love when the guests have fun here. Our, our viewers are great, right? They're really nice with the comments. Their pictures good are photos great. photos and good questions. I know. And beat it. What more could you ask for? We will. We'll talk about that. Thank you, all of you, for watching. Thank you, Sam, for moderating. Thank you, Justin, for handling all of the craziness in the corner over there. I don't know how you do it. And we will see you all next week. And the theme is food. Get your food photos ready. Yes. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Bye, Thank guys. You. Thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs> that is all. That is a fun photo to switch over to. Could you guys hear my story?